thank you so much for joining us here at uh, Fetal Care Chat, produced by the Fetal Health Foundation. My name is Lonnie Summers, and I am so excited to be with you today on this wonderful March 18th. I hope everyone had a good and safe St. Patrick's Day. Uh, we are talking about today women in fetal medicine, and I am so excited and honored because all three of these women I know on various levels and so excited to have them because they are true pioneers in the world of fetal medicine. And we're going to be speaking with them today about uh, discussing around their role in fetal medicine, what inspired them, what barriers or obstacles they faced, and potentially continue to face, and encouragement for the future of, of uh, women students coming into fetal medicine. And so with that, I would love to introduce to you today, we have Dr. Jenna Miller. She is the assistant professor at John Hopkins Center for Fetal Therapy, and her expertise includes operative photoscopy, management of complicated monochronic twins, fetal growth restriction, and perinatal diagnosis and treatment. Also would love to welcome Dr. Courtney Stevenson is a permanent obstetrician, gynecologist, and maternal fetal medicine specialist serving the community of Charlotte, North Carolina since 2009. Uh, she has consistently been voted one of the top doctors in Charlotte. Her clinical knowledge of high-risk multiple fetal pregnancies extends to the distinctions of being the first female OBGYN to perform intrauterine microwave ablation procedure for the treatment of twin reverse arterial perfusion sequence. And then we're also welcoming Dr. Diana Farmer. She's internationally renowned fetal and neonatal surgeon and distinguished professor and Pearl Stamp Stewart endowed chair of the UC Davis Department of Surgery and surgeon in chief of the UC Davis Children's Hospital. Her uh, lab had made the seminal discovery that hindbrain herniation could be emulated by perinatal repair in fetal sheep. And I know I just said a whole bunch of words that I probably don't even understand. So I probably botched those up, but welcome uh, Dr. Stephen, <coughs> Dr. Miller and Dr. Farmer for joining us this morning. Thank you. Well, thank you. And for those of you that are watching us live, certainly feel free on Facebook. If you have any questions for these wonderful three women, please feel free to ask those questions there and then we will certainly try to get to them. Um, so this is, I'm so excited because first of all, obviously March is, is uh, International Women's History Month, International Women's Month, and you three of you have certainly been pioneers. Uh, starting with uh, Dr. Farmer, uh, what got you interested in doing fetal medicine? And tell us a little bit about your journey. Absolutely. Well, thank you, Lonnie, for making this whole thing come together. Uh, just before this got started, we uh, three fetal women uh, just had fun chatting together and getting to know one another as well. So thank you for bringing this uh, to, uh, to us and to the public. So my journey um, is probably a little circuitous. I think many will end up saying that's true. It's the twists and turns and the unexpected things that happen in your life that uh, bring you one to where they are. I will say the area of fetal medicine has been particularly gratifying because it's, it's kind of a new area of medicine and it's benefited from having from being what we call multidisciplinary, having people from all different perspectives look at the same problem and that's made us better. So you'll find, I think today that all three of us come from different backgrounds. But if you think about it, just two generations ago, nobody knew anything about a fetus before they were born. You, know, you, you got pregnant and you kind of waited till the baby was born and then you counted fingers and toes and hoped everything was okay. And and there were some miscarriages, but we didn't really know much about that. But then along came ultrasound and you could look inside and see the fetus. So all of a sudden that created a new world. In the beginning, I think we looked inside just to make sure whether they were twins or whether the baby was upside down or things like that. But occasionally we saw things that looked like problems. I came to the fetal business, if you will, through the fetal enterprise, we, we never know how to talk about it, um, through the lens of being a pediatric surgeon, meaning I was a surgeon, and I guess I still am, a surgeon who primarily operated on babies after birth with some problem, some birth defect, some thing. Sometimes they were as simple as hernias, but sometimes they were babies who were missing an arm or had cleft lip and palate or were born with some 
body part that wasn't connected right. So we baby surgeons asked the question, um, was, there, it, was there a way we could, well, could we make, could we improve our ability to make these babies better, to cure their defect or their disease? So it really we, wasn't about monitoring pregnancies or monitoring um, maternal health during pregnancy. It was about improving the outcomes of babies with certain diagnoses. That is the perspective that we surgeons, general surgeons, pediatric surgeons brought to the field. The, and mostly structural problems, um, not so much a baby with a diagnosis of a blood problem or a, what we call a medical problem. So ours was that unique perspective and that's what got me involved. And the first, a couple of the first things were the frustrations that we children's surgeons saw from finding a very simple problem that we could fix after birth. And a classic example are babies who were born with a hole in the muscle between their bellies and their chest. And it's, as a surgeon, it's really easy to fix a hole, you know, to put in a patch. I mean, I like to say we're kind of just glorified plumbers. Um, you know, we just fix the holes, unplug the blockages. It's, it's kind of not very glamorous. Um, except if you've got one of those problems, it's a really big deal. So we could easily plug the hole, fix the problem. But the babies didn't always survive. That wasn't enough. And it appeared that the reason it wasn't enough was that having this problem before birth, we've now learned by studying what we call the natural history, by studying fetuses as they develop, we learned that if you have this blockage too early in, in your pregnancy, then it, it prevents the lung from growing. It causes other problems. If you have it late in the pregnancy, it's, no, it's usually no big deal. So there was a lot to learn. It was such an exciting time for me now, 30 years ago, when this was a brand new field, and I was just a student you know, watching people think about this and thinking about new ways to take care of patients and asking the question, could you operate before birth? And what would that take? And going to the animal labs to study that and going to uh, the primate centers to learn about pregnancy and what you could do or not do and what a pregnancy would tolerate. So for me, it was just the most exciting time to be part of a new Field. Were there obstacles? Absolutely. Um, but I also think that by being a woman, I brought a unique perspective. Um, and being a female is part of what motivated me to write the original MOMS trial, the fetal surgery for spina bifida trial, because I knew that that was the disease that would make fetal surgery operating on babies before birth go viral, so to speak, in today's parlance. And I didn't want that to happen because I knew that it's a big operation that like all other big operations like liver transplant, there would ultimately be complications for women. And I didn't want that to happen unless we knew that it really was gonna help babies. So it's an amazing field to be in. I'll stop here so that my other colleagues can share as well. No, thank you for that. And it's been amazing. And the work that you've done in the uh, spina bifida uh, repair and research has been tremendous. Uh, Dr. Miller, let's, uh, I'd like to love to ask you the same question. What got you involved into your journey of fetal medicine? Well, I mean, I feel like it was also a bit of an evolution over, you know, and, and really step by step and finding, you know, the next thing that was for me that I became really passionate about. So, um, you know, when I decided to do maternal fetal medicine fellowship during residency, um, you know, I really didn't know exactly, you know, my goal in the beginning was I wanted to be able to handle any situation that happened during pregnancy for a woman. I wanted to be able to take care of any 
any issue that could possibly come up and never wanted to be standing there not not knowing what to do. So um, so originally, you know, going into maternal fetal medicine, I just had a very broad perspective. And then um, the day before fellowship started, I came in to uh, find out where labor and delivery is, where are things going, what's happening. And they were actually doing laser surgery for twin fin transfusion syndrome. And so my current um, boss and mentor actually was like, oh, come with us, come see what it's all about. And, you know, from that moment, that was the coolest thing I had ever, ever seen. And I was like, and I'm going to learn that. So that <laughs> there's no question about that. And so, um, so really, you know, just from, I would say, from the beginning of fellowship, just having this awakening of what tremendous possibility there could be to handle conditions, diseases that can change the absolute trajectory of the life of you know, a child, or in this case, twins, that, you know, was just, you know, kind of the aha moment as far as that goes. And so they were pretty stuck with me from, from then on out. And, you know, and, and every case uh, was, I was always like present and ready to go. And, and so, you know, for me, it was really that apprenticeship type process that really started from the beginning of fellowship. And so with that, I was just truly fortunate that my mentor was, you know, really fostered that and helped me along the way and, you know, directed me of, you need to go, you know, for this opportunity, you need to go here, you need to learn this. And so that um, certainly catapulted me down, down this path um, to where we are now. That's amazing. I mean, it's a, so amazing to hear the stories of how everyone got involved. And I love the fact that you're like, wow, laser, that is super cool. I got to learn how to do that. Go that ahead. is awesome. Go ahead. It never gets old, actually. <laughs> <laughs> I, I have uh, been uh, honored to actually have been in the operating room a few times watching a couple of procedures. And I am in complete awe. And uh, Dr. Farmer, when you say we're just kind of glorified plumbers, just unplugging, plugging things and stuff like that, it is truly miraculous to watch uh, how proficient and how amazing uh, that all, all of you are uh, when you're doing uh, photoscopy surgery or open fetal surgery. It's just completely mind boggling because, uh, um, you know, it's, uh, bef I can't even make heads or tails sometimes of whatever even the placenta is, is you guys are so quick with the scopes and uh, you've got everything mapped out. So it's, it's pretty, pretty amazing. You guys are true, truly amazing at what you do. Dr. Stevenson, I would love to ask you also the same question. What got you involved in fetal medicine? And, and I know a little bit that you had a, an incredibly gymnastic, you're incredibly uh, great gymnastics. So you're probably one of the few, very few fetal surgeons, male or female, that can probably do, that actually not can do, but you do handstands. Just, you know, you probably could do that for about an hour or so. <laughs> That's very funny. Um, well, thank you for um, inviting me today. I'm honored to be here. And um, I appreciate Dr. Farmer and Dr. Miller's response because um, you took the words right out of my mouth, literally. I mean, there's something like Dr. Farmer was saying about um, trying to change the outcome. When you understand the physiology of fetal growth and development and you see a problem that you can um, ameliorate in utero and fix, then the baby actually has a chance to grow and develop normally, which is pretty remarkable and fascinating. Um, and then also Dr. Miller, you know, um, kind of being the, the, the backstop, the end all, like not having to send anything out. I have the same drive of being like, I wanna be able to take care of everything that comes in this door and I wanna know how to fix all of it, you know? And so there, there's that passion too. Um, but yeah, the gymnastics um, background, I was an All-American athlete and um, bronze medal gymnast. So, I'm, you know, um, there's something about that level of focus and concentration and being able to block everything out in the room um, that translates um, into the operating room as a surgeon. Um, I remember the first time I scrubbed with Dr. Crumbleholm and uh, I felt like I was in the, the chalk box getting on the, the bars, you know, while I was scrubbing my hands. It was, it was pretty surreal. But um, I got started for the same reasons previously stated, but also um, there was a, a lack of um, uh, access to the community in the Southeast um, in, my, in our region, North Carolina. And so I had um, called Dr. Crumb home and asked him if he would teach me. And at the time there wasn't a real formal fellowship. So um, he said, you know, you could come watch and just see. And 
And so I went and I watched and I went out there one about five days and I had a great time. I learned so much. I loved it. And um, uh, I said, you know, do you mind if I come back? Like, I really, I really enjoyed this. He's like, no, you can come back anytime. And so I decided to show up every six weeks in his OR and stand there and watch. <laughs> and after about three years, I was like, you know, you think I can scrub one of these days? And, you know, so that's kind of, I just kind of strong armed my way in and just kept showing up and I had to get, you know, a high state license and um, malpractice insurance and children's hospital privileges, which isn't easy for an OBGYN since they don't do, they don't have a labor and delivery. Um, but I, 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 I ended up, um, took a while, I did it all. And then I brought the program back to Charlotte. So um, it, it was pretty, it's pretty incredible. Um, but, you know, like Dr. Farmer said, being a woman um, also adds a whole nother dimension to our being surgeons and, and, and taking care of women. And um, I really believe in maternal intuition. I listen to all my patients because I don't believe we understand everything about the fetus and what's going on inside the uterus. And if that woman says to me, doc, you know, I just, something's not right. I don't, I don't know what it is. That really, really scares me. I'm like, okay, you know, stop everything. We've got to figure this out and make sure everything's okay. And, and so I, I do believe in maternal intuition um, and, uh, and listen really, really carefully. And um, one other little side, <clears throat> which I think is kind of hilarious, but when I was traveling back and forth for three years, it was probably the second trip or third trip I took. My son called me in the hotel. It was kind of, he was seven. He was a little bit disgusted. Like, mom, you've, you've, been, you've been going out there a lot. Like, what are you doing? Why can't you, why can't you get this right? You know, <laughs> why is it taking you so long to learn this surgery? <laughs> and I was like trying to explain. I was like, well, you don't just, you know, learn in one visit. You know, you have to keep going. And he says, look, just to open up her belly and stick the pill in the baby's butt and come home. That, that was his, that was concept of fetal surgery. It was like, open her belly, stick the pill in the baby's butt and come home. Like, you know, so it, it was, it was funny. And my daughter would cry when I'd leave and I couldn't take it. And I was like, you know, if you're going to keep crying, I just can't go. I just, I just can't do it. So you're breaking my heart. So we got to be on a team. Like we got to do this together if you want to do it. And she says, you know, mom, we're saving babies. I'm like, yeah, we're going to save babies, but I need your help. And so you know, it does take a family too, you know, family support and backing because um, we are more than just doctors and surgeons. We're, we're mothers and, and um, partners and things. So, you know, it's, it's uh, I think women surgeons bring a lot to uh, medicine um, beyond just our skill set. Uh, that's incredible. It, it kind of going on uh, your journey um, for all three of you, whoever would like to uh, potentially answer this question was there any pushback I mean, obviously it's a it was, has it has changed uh, quite a bit in the in the last uh, several years uh, but uh, it's still pretty predominantly male dominated has there been did you have any obstacles or any challenges working your way into fetal medicine well I can uh, address that maybe from the beginning because obviously in the early I am the first female fetal surgeon uh, and it was a long time before there, and particularly the first uh, woman that was doing open fetal surgery. And it, it took a few years before there were those behind me, um, but now there's a cadre of people doing this work, which is so inspiring to me. But there's, you know, I early on uh, was a scientist essentially, and we were writing clinical trials and we were studying fetal diseases, as I mentioned, in the animal laboratories and in the uh, a variety of different centers. And like everything in science, there's always, the higher up you go, the more competition there is for grants, for credits on grants. Uh, fetal surgery all of a sudden got popular. It was not for the first decade of this work. In fact, there, that's an interesting side note, but in the early days, people particularly the, uh, if you will, the right to life community thought this was violating the sanctity of the womb and that this was uh, not an appropriate thing to do. And if you look at some of the articles in the 1980s, they were very critical of this work, that this was, uh, was not appropriate. 
uh, it's a credit to the early pioneers that they stayed out of that debate, whether the fetus was a person, but really focused on the fetus as a patient. And fast forward today, that same um, right to life community is very supportive of fetal intervention because it is an alternative to pregnancy termination and a way to save more babies' lives. So there's a really interesting lesson there that focusing on the medicine and the science is the job of we scientists. And it is up to society to decide what are sort of appropriate social mores. And I mention it again because of the new technologies that are available to us. Um, I myself am involved in stem cell therapy and we just got FDA approval and have just opened a clinical trial to add stem cells to the spina bifida repair. And we've had amazing results in uh, sheep studies and with dogs who have naturally occurring spina bifida and really think there's a chance now to uh, prevent that paralysis. And it's amazing. This will be a very, we, you know, the FDA is very cautious. This is, these are scary things to think about, putting stem cells in a fetus. And so we'll do only three patients the first year. It'll be slow until we know it's safe. But stem cells are just, if you ask me, kind of the early intervention. But many of my colleagues doing research, Dr. Tippy McKenzie at UCSF is looking at gene therapy for a variety of disorders that children get. People are looking at gene therapies for, for many um, uh, genetically related diseases that kids get. But wouldn't it be amazing if we could save all these kids from a lifetime of suffering? And that's one of the reasons that, you know, spina bifida was such an interest to me. In a way, we started with fetal surgery for only life-threatening conditions because we didn't know about the safety for moms. And of course, the safety has gotten better all the time. And if you compare it to things like living-related liver transplant or kidney transplant, where a person undergoes a big operation with no benefit to themselves, but the benefit to someone else, it's amazing that people do this. But it, our safety profile for women has been phenomenal. I think that's a credit to the slow start of this field. But that having been said, as science develops, there will be new ethical challenges. And now this CRISPR-Cas ability to genetically alter, the, uh, to, to modify, to improve, to take away a, a gene that might cause sickle cell or things like that, wouldn't you want that for your child? If you knew your child was gonna have a lifetime of blood transfusions and, and pain and suffering, absolutely you would want that. But there are a lot of ethical challenges. So that's what keeps this field incredibly exciting and, and so interesting. And it, it's so important to have people like me who come at it from the perspective of spending my life taking care of babies with their birth defects and diseases, to come at it from the perspective of my OBGYN maternal fetal medicine colleagues who come at it with the perspective of, you know, what's best for the mother and the, the maternal fetal unit in terms of the pregnancy, managing complications related to the pregnancy as well. Uh, our, ethics, our ethics colleagues who help us think about these things, that's what makes it so rich. Um, it's, this field has so, it's, we're not done. Just because we can do some operations and we can do some laser surgery, but, you know, we're not, we've just started down this journey of presenting dis disease before birth. There are many people uh, who are doing great work on the fetal origins of adult disease. What if we could prevent you from getting diabetes later on or high blood pressure? There's a lot of work suggesting that, that, that uh, things that happen during the pregnancy influence those in, for your child. So, I mean, it, I think it's absolutely the coolest place to be. I think 
every scientist is missing out if they're not doing work in this field. Um, and we've got a lot more to do. So um, the, I will say, to get back to your specific question about obstacles, I was mentioning that as a scientist, the more, the more, the higher you go, the, or the more popular your field, the greater the competition. And the competition for grants, for credit on grants, I mentioned, really um, can get intense. But one should never let that discourage them. Uh, uh, because I have found that even when I was most discouraged, there was some other opportunity, some new partner, some new job, some, some new environment that kept me going through those sort of discouraging times. Um, but we all have stories we don't like to talk about so much in public about, you know, who made it hard to, you know, do this or, you know, said you can't be the first author or you can't be the uh, the PI on the grant or this or that. But you know, if you let those things make you bitter, then you won't move forward to the next step. So that's my advice for young people. It's always gonna be hard. And if you're a pioneer, it's probably harder, but the rewards of keeping going are really spectacular. Well, that's what I heard. Dr. Miller, Dr. Stevenson, anything to add? Um, yeah, I, I, you know, I you, you I, I'm, that I was just listening to Dr. Farmer talk about the ethics and I was thinking of our patients, you know, these women that, um, I find incredibly brave and heroic and, um, we didn't always have a lot of science all the time. Like we, we, we were trying to save a life and, um, they wanted us to save that life and, and it's quite profound, and I, I say this a lot, but these women lay themselves on an operating table in total health with no surgical reason, except for faith and love of a baby they've never even laid eyes on, one that they can feel. Um, and, um, and I find it incredibly moving and profound and remarkable. And um, you know what, what Dr. Farmer and Dr. Miller do, they're more in the scientific you know, research side than I am, more clinical, but what they're trying to do is establish protocols and guidelines and standards. But, you know, for a while there weren't really great ones because we were just trying to, we weren't, had, didn't have a lot of numbers. Um, you know, somebody did five, somebody else did four, somebody else did 10, and we're trying to put all those numbers together. Um, so a lot of it is just um, the patient and her faith and desire and her um, autonomy and will and, um, and our ability to uh, want to do the right thing and try to save the baby um, that you know, hasn't yet taken a breath. You know? and it's, so um, there's, there's, a, there's a lot of um, moral ethical uh, hurdles to fetal surgery. And, um, and I appreciate Dr. Farmer for making it easier for us you know, and breaking some of those ceilings. Um, but you know, it, it's something as a woman, and I, and I, I, I'm going to um, keep it all positive, like Dr. Dr. Farmer, and just say, you know, I, I, my, my hurdle was I'd walk in the room and everybody'd expect a six foot tall man, and I was five two, <laughs> female, and people were like, where's the doctor? Where, you know, where the patients kind of disappointed when they see how small I am. They're like, really, you're the one going to be in charge and. I'm like, yep, I'm in charge. I got you. Don't you worry about a thing. I got, you know, but, you know, there's confidence and stature sometimes and gender that, that I think our uh, society is moving past. But um, that was probably my, one of my hurdles that's a little bit humorous. Yeah, yeah I, I think that's all um, equally reflected in, in my practice and experience as well, you know, and we... Uh, I think as a woman in medicine and in fetal medicine, this very small niche of a field, it really is important for us to stay focused on, you know, what are our initial motivators? Yes, as a maternal fetal medicine specialist, protecting women, protect, you know, making sure that we're safeguarding 
them through these challenging cases and procedures and, and really working through the shared decision making of what's the right choice for each individual condition and family um, and trying to stay focused on, on the science and overcoming some of the obstacles we have of, of equipment, of technique. And just as Dr. Farmer said, we are just in the beginning of what we can do and really everything needs to be optimized that we do. I mean, we're using the same equipment from 20 years ago, <laughs> hasn't really changed much. And so, you know, for us to remain that we have to keep diligently moving forward and, you know, shepherding women and families through this process. And, um, and so I think one of the obstacles that I think we all have to face is not to also get in your own way and, get discouraged if things don't exactly work out right and it really is a long game. And one thing that I'm really grateful for actually is because of, you know, pioneers and the generation who began this charge is the women who, you know, I've met within the fetal medicine community. It's a really special group of women. And I think, you know, moving forward, it is a, um, I don't know if it's shift is the right word, but it is a collaborative. It is, um, you know, the women that I meet across the country who have these same passions, they are mutually supportive and interested in collaboration. And, and I think that's going to be huge for the things that we can move into next. Let me, I, so I agree completely. I think it is still a bias, uh, but I do think that in general, um, women are more collaborative than men and less worried about sort of the competition that I was referring to. Uh, so I think that, I think the field, the future is bright for the field because I do think that more women, uh, particularly on the OBGYN side, but also on the pediatric surgery side, that used to be a field that was highly, highly male dominated um, because it was in a way, it's kind of one of the hardest of the surgical subspecialties to get into in the early days, there were only about 12 fellowships in the country. So, um, but as that has changed and as more women have gotten involved, that then it develops a pipeline for women who are pediatric surgeons who are interested in fetal surgery. And, I, and it, it's just a bias. Who knows, that may change when there are more of us there, but I do think that women are more collaborative. I want to pick up also on something that you said, Dr. Stevenson, um, the real heroes in this whole field are the mothers who um, have been, you know, you could, you could say guinea pigs. I don't actually think about research that way, but who were willing to be partners in research. Imagine that very first woman who had a fetal operation. And we had to say to her, this has never been done before. We could say, now we've done it in, you know, a hundred sheep and 25 monkeys, but it's not the same. Um, but we know a lot and we're gonna, we promise we're gonna make you safe and you will be our first priority. But we honestly think that we can do something to help your child. I mean, that, is the most, that was the bravest woman ever. I mean, none of this could have happened without the women and their families who have been partners. I've had many circumstances when I was counseling a family about whether or not to have fetal surgery where the partner said, you know what? No, I do not want to risk, potentially risk the life of my partner I don't want to support this. And it, so it's interesting to see how each family is different. Each woman is different, um, where she gets her guidance and support for her decision making, because ultimately it's her decision. But the, the women who have undergone these procedures, they strike me, again, coming out of the world of general surgery, so similar to the amazing people who donate a kidney to a stranger or you know often it's a mother or a father who donates a piece of their liver to their child so it's, it's a very similar ethical thing and those people are extraordinary 
And I feel the same way about all the women who have been partners in this, uh, in what we've learned about fetal health and fetal medicine, because none of it, none of it would be possible without them. I mean, they are the scientists in many ways. So I think you guys made fabulous points about both of those things. Thank you so much for that. And actually, um, Dr. Stevenson, we have somebody that just wrote in and a former patient of yours said, thank you so much for the work that all three of you do. Uh, you guys are doing amazing things and giving a fighting chance for these babies. Parents want nothing more than the best outcome. And really that all turns into hope. Um, you provide hope. And I think that I know, and, and Talitha, who is on here too, is our executive director of the Fetal Health Foundation, who also went through twin to twin as we did um, also went through uh, amniotic band syndrome on that same pregnancy, um, had a lot of challenges. And, and what we have found through fetal health and working with so many patients and families and going through it, our own experiences, when we first got that diagnosis, um, as Dr. Farmer, as you said, some, there's a lot of ethical things that come into play. And one of the things that I attribute to that I feel like the it's hard to get attention around fetal medicine from the general public. It's kind of awe and spot. It's kind of amazing what's being done, but it doesn't get the same attention as, as other diseases and syndromatic issues. And for me, I've always said that's part of it is because the, at the beginning, the only person that truly has that relationship with that baby or babies is mom. Um, nobody, it is, it is yet to be, even though it's my unborn child, it's my unborn sister, my unborn future niece, I don't have a relationship with them as I do with my, my mother who might have, you know, breast cancer or whatever. And we found it very challenging to do that. And it's a very high emotional time, as you all know, when a family's going through that, because usually as we've experienced, we see so many families experiences, you go immediately to that family support. Um, foundation that you have, but there's a lot of confusion in the family <laughs> because they don't necessarily have the same relationship. And sometimes even with their, their partner, there's not even the same relationship that they have. And I find it extremely uh, amazing whether it is uh, the three of you as being pioneers in the different fields that you do with fetal medicine as surgeons, but also the amazing amount of women as nurses and care coordinators and stuff that really truly take care of, of the patients coming in, the families. Um, my experience was we went to a perinatologist, the bedside manners were terrible, we were terrified. And now all of a sudden, you know, a few days later, we're flying to Florida, from Colorado to see this top expert um, published in all these different things. It was scary, it was intimidating and um, it was, an amazing amount of calmness getting in there. Uh, I mean, there was high, high anxiety for sure, but amazing amount of calmness because everybody all of a sudden became um, such a high level of care and understanding. Um, and that was something, uh, you know, I, I unbelievable. You, you, you all became our surrogate family to us and the level of compassion and care. And so um, it's quite a remarkable field in that because you don't see that as, as much um, as, and sometimes in some other fields. So um, it's pretty incredible um, on that side of it. What do you think, you know, Dr. Farmer, you said something that stuck out um, to me is, is um, in the world of manufacturing and things like that and process improvements, we have Six Sigma and we have other things of what we call the upstream uh, processes, which is really, we, we tend to look at things downstream and try to fix problems, but really it's upstream where things are at. Um, as you guys are pioneering this, I'm always amazed and have been amazed as Slyth and I both have been in fetal medicine is um, the, because this is such a small, true niche <laughs> when you look at other areas of medicine, but some of these things can have implications outside of just fetal medicine, which is where I think things not only get very exciting for fetal medicine and being able to prevent these things, but what they can do for the future. What are your thoughts around that? Well, great question. Um, I'll start by saying things twofold. Um, rare diseases, it's always hard to get attention for rare diseases. So the work that you all have done is really fantastic. Also, there's a stigma, I would say, and the phrase birth defects, even the March of Dimes, 
who really started out with polio um, has struggled with how to talk about uh, the work they do uh, to support research on birth defects. They've been involved now in prematurity because that seemed sort of easier to talk about. It's not as scary. Everybody wants to assume their pregnancy is going to be fine, right? No one, you, you never think about, oh my gosh, in a way that's good because we might not have so many babies if everybody knew all the scary things that could happen. <laughs> <laughs> but so it's good that in general we, uh, and it's, and it is the truth that in general, um, most pregnancies do just fine, which that's a good thing. Um, but we're here specifically to take care of the situations when that's not the case. Sometimes for mother, high risk pregnancies for mom, and sometimes for the baby. Pediatric surgeons always had this perspective because we only take care of rare diseases and rare problems. You talked about the effect that this work might have on other things. And I'll just use spina bifida as an example. So we've done this research work to, and identified that placental stem cells have unique characteristics. And I, I got involved with the placenta because as a fetal surgeon, I was always thought that placenta was this amazing thing that it kept pregnancies, uh, kept babies alive during pregnancy and it kept, um, but it was, it its whole lifespan is just nine months. It comes out of nothing sort of and is done in there. So just an amazing organ if you ask me. And great research opportunity for things like vascular development because it's a, basically a bunch of blood vessels. You know, so much to be learned there. So those stem cells that we are deriving now from the placenta and sort of engineering for neural improvement, we now realize that even though we were focused on spina bifida, which is a rare disease, may have implications for other neurologic diseases like spinal cord injury, like um, multiple sclerosis, maybe even Alzheimer's. I mean, and, and I certainly wasn't thinking about any of those things. I'm a, I'm a baby doctor. Um, but I think lots of other exciting work is gonna come out from the, the work that goes into learning about how to take care of rare diseases. So uh, there's lots of reasons to do what you guys are doing. In, in addition to advocating for the patients who have this, the research that comes out has, has helped other women with other pregnancy problems. We've learned a lot about preterm labor through the development of fetal surgery because we had to figure out how to control preterm labor. Um, so in fact, the cynics have said that's the most important thing that may come out of fetal surgery. But uh, there are many spin-offs uh, in ways that this work I think can help uh, humanity in general. Bonnie, I would like to add to something you said, if that's okay. Um, Please. I think that um, something really powerful, uh, because what we do is so unique and um, sometimes the data isn't you know, crystal clear, because like we talked about before, numbers and things, you know, what's really, really important is your relationship with the patient. And um, I spend hours counseling pa my patients, getting to know them, what are their hopes, making sure their, you know, expectations are realistic and what they think they will get from the procedure. So it's good understanding and consent is really, truly informed. Um, and, you know, and because we can't actually promise an outcome sometimes, you know, things, things, there's so few cases that we don't always know how it's going to turn out. And actually with fetoscopy, and I'm, I'm sure Dr. Farmer and Dr. Miller can relate, is we don't actually know the beast that we're facing until we put the camera in and they're like, okay, oh, now, I, now I'm up against this. And so there's a lot that goes on. Um, and a lot of it, again, is um, the patient's wishes, um, you know, um, I, I, like if you can't promise an outcome, which what I always promise my patients is my best human effort and that I wouldn't let anything in my human power happen to them or their baby. And that's the, the most promise you can give because you don't actually know, you know, necessarily the, how the fetus is going to respond to the surgery. You know, they both going to make it out of the laser surgery and all that. And so what we end up doing is actually providing peace of mind. And um, these, these women have tremendous courage and faith. 
And, uh, you know, and, and God forbid, even if they don't have survivors, they actually, I feel like, I feel like walk away in peace, at least knowing they had done everything they could, including a surgery that they personally didn't need. And so, um, again, it's, it's all, for me, and, and I know for us, for fetal um, interventionalists, it's, it's really about the relationship with the patient and understanding what their, what their, um, their needs are, their faith base, their, their comprehension of medicine, everything goes into it. And, and, and these families are, they're part of my heart and soul forever. And um, I feel like at the end of the journey, we're, we're like one big family. And, and I, I feel really fortunate um, to have all these great relationships and um, but it's, it's hard, you know, the, the losses are really tough. They're really painful. And, um, um, but we, you know, everything's about just doing everything you can in human power. And the you know, rest course. is up to something beyond our, uh, beyond our comprehension. Yeah, Courtney, that, what a great comment because you're, you're coming about how they're part of your lives forever. I have to admit my first fetal, not my first fetal patient, but one of my fetal patients that I've stayed in touch with which is the great fun of being a pediatric surgeon too, because you often take care of that, that fetus after they're born, um, is now in college and uh, stays in touch with me. And partly because when they go see other doctors, they have no idea what you had, what? Yeah. Uh, so that's yeah. super fun. Uh, that yeah. is super fun. And one yeah. of the fun things about being on um, my side of the equation, if you will, that's, yeah. You're absolutely right. These are in, these are intense relationships that one develops uh, with these families. For sure. I mean, when they come in, you just want to be sure that they can take a deep breath and relax. You know that that your job to pick up the, however they came to you, however they got there. That together you're going to figure out what is the right path. And like you said, Dr. Stevenson, you can't guarantee it's going to be the outcome we dream and that we want, but you know we always will will try and do our best because it is tough. It's a tough road for some families to actually get to that point, you know. And um, so many families who say we have, you know, we felt like we had to advocate, we had to, you know, do our own research and do our own efforts to figure out, you know, if we were really exploring all our options. And so, you know, I know together. I hope that we all achieve that for, for the families that, that come and can take some of the pressure off and allow them to just, you know, make decisions with a clear mind and know that we have their best interest in mind. So Lonnie, that's really your, that's where you guys are so helpful in mm -hmm. all of this, because these are great points that most of these families have had trouble finding out where to go and where there was expertise. So I actually think it's, you made me think it's part of our responsibility to help get this into medical school curriculums and other places so that family practice docs who might often be the first contact for somebody who's pregnant or their sort of community obstetrician might not necessarily know all these things. Um, we, just like other rare diseases, um, we, we need to make sure that the whole medical community and uh, midwives and ancillary help people who take, are often the first point of contact for folks uh, know that, hey, I don't exactly know all this stuff, but I know there are places you can go that will um, help you. The reason it's harder in pregnancy is your time window shorter. You know, with some other diagnoses, you've got plenty of time. So the work that you've done, Lonnie, in terms of education and the information that's on websites and things like that, I think is really important to helping these people. And it's really sad. I've seen some folks come who were a little too late, uh, might not now be safe or the risk profile was greater just because it took took a long time to find out where to go and also misinformation you're absolutely right mm -hmm. um, 
uh, Jenna, your comment about people having to advocate for themselves. People have been told, no, in fact, we just separated some conjoined twins and they were, ad they were advised to terminate the pregnancy, that there was nothing that could be done before they got to our fetal care center. We said, oh, no, 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 this, let's look at the MRI. This looks very doable, mm -hmm. um, but they, it was a journey for them advocating for themselves. Yeah, no, thank you for that, Dr. Farmer. And, and um, it is something that we work very hard on at Fetal Health. And we, we, with a lot of new initiatives that we have is to try to get more information and awareness out there and I'll have families and medical profession, you know, we, we try to educate families so much, but obviously no one, as you said, no one expects their pregnancy to have a complication. So not until that complication does usually typically then they start researching stuff on the web. It's a short time frame. It's a very high emotional stand time frame. So it's a, it's a hard time to really educate families previous to that. And you certainly don't want to scare everybody with pamphlets in the, uh, their OBGYN office when they're going in and find excited that they're pregnant. And oh, by the way, here's the potential, you know, low risk, but here's the 1000 things that potentially affect your pregnancy. <laughs> um, so it's definitely tough, but getting to the medical community, um, the family practitioner, the OBGYNs, uh, the rural areas, or even sometimes in major cities, we've seen it where um, uh, the, the uh, uh, first diagnosis takes place and, and because of lack of information for them to know what resources are available to them and their patients, um, the healthcare professional will, you know, sometimes we do see uh, them recommending termination or that there's no hope in this. And, and really it's, it's getting them to you um, all and seeing what can be done and giving that chance for hope. And I think one of the themes that we've talked about throughout this is, is what really because of being women and what you bring in, you bring that maternal understanding that the woman, the, the mom has with baby and the importance of that, of really, a, yes, this is a patient, we can make it very clinical and, and sometimes dry, but this is, this is my future child. This is my hopes and dreams of having a family. And that's being ripped away from me during a diagnosis. Um, and we just want that hope. And, and when we went through twin to twin uh, 18 years ago, um, I remember the we, we certainly, it was nerve wracking, the surgery took place, there was a couple of complications, some things they hadn't seen before, which was always the wonderful thing you wanna hear as a patient or the uh, spouse is like, oh, we've never seen this before. Well, what does that mean? Um, but there was such a weight lifted off of, uh, for me personally, the shoulders of at least of saying, at least we've been able to give some hope. There's a chance. We've done something as opposed to doing nothing. And I think um, that uh, was such a, a relief. We have, my, we could talk, I think, all day because of the amazing work that you guys have done. I, I wanna jump in on a couple last topics. And one of those is, is that COVID has obviously turned everything upside down. Um, and that's an understatement. Um, but would love to get from your perspective um, in your own areas of medicine, um, what, what you're seeing, is there concern? Is there any concern that if a mom has COVID during pregnancy, is that causing any, do we see any preliminary data yet that is, it could be causing any harm to the baby? Um, and also just in general, you know, the, the, as vaccines are being rolled out, I think that there's um, some conflicting information about if a mom who's pregnant should be getting the vaccine and stuff. So I don't know who would like to take that maybe. Dr. Miller, we haven't heard a lot. Well, I'll give you an opportunity to go first this time. So, I mean, I think we really need to acquire a lot of the data. What we see and observe so far, a lot of it is anecdotal to know if there's causation, if there are, you know, is there an association with additional pregnancy complications? I don't think we can be definitive about that quite yet. Um, the messaging that we have been giving to the patients is, in line with what our professional societies recommend, that if a woman is pregnant and eligible for vaccination, that, that it should not be withheld from them. Um, if the type of vaccine is one that we expect to be safe during pregnancy, since there is no live virus that is, is being given in any of the options that are available. Um, and also the importance we've been in encouraging women to register with the VSA registry at the, with the CDC when they do um, get vaccinated so that we have a really robust way to understand um, the 
impact on pregnancy and what women experience during pregnancy if it's different from, from the remainder of the population. Dr. Stevenson, Dr. Farmer, anything to add on that? I think we've, I agree completely that the, the data is not sufficient for us to make really uh, concrete recommendations. A lot of fabulous work was done initially in New York in the early days of all of this. Uh, it, it appears that the uh, transmission is very low to maybe none across the placenta, so to say. There are some children <clears throat> who, the, some babies can get COVID, no question about it. Uh, it appears that that transmission uh, is not directly uh, maternal fetal most of the time. It, again, I'm hedging everything because the, de the definitive information isn't there. Same with um, vaccines. There's some anxiety. There's uh, some confusion. It is, however, true that if a pregnant woman acquires COVID, um, we've had some, we've had babies who've been delivered while the mother was in the ICU or on ECMO or in terrible situations. Um, but having, a, having a, an ill mother is worse for the baby than having a safe, a non-ill mother. So for the few women who have had terrible uh, experiences with COVID, in, in retrospect, had they been able to be immunized and not be as sick as they were, that would have resulted in better outcomes for their children. So uh, again, not a not tremendous amount of guidance, but in general, um, I would say uh, I'm, I'm nervous about making this broad recommendation, but if vaccines are available, uh, first of all, you should try to avoid it, you know, and, and all of that, but if vaccines are available, I certainly recommend it for um, everybody when it's available, when their time comes up, and that that ultimately will be um, the best for their future child. No, thank, thank you for that. And I, I can, you know, I'm, I'm not medical, but in the work that we've done and seen so far is that, um, you know, if you're pregnant, take all the CDC recommendations, uh, mask, stay socially distanced, don't get in large group gatherings because the, uh, while there's still a lot of stuff to be determined, we don't know anything. We, we as you said, Dr. Farmer, we're hedging uh, a lot of information right now because we just don't know. We don't have the information readily available. And so taking the the uh, appropriate path to ensure safety for mom and baby and making sure mom doesn't get very sick because obviously if mom is very sick, um, you know, it may the effects of baby could be uh, more preterm labor complications. Um, but I know that some of the stuff had come out to say a little bit was some concern. Um, we have just a couple of minutes left and, and oh my God, I can't I tell you how much I appreciate it. This is so fascinating. Again, I could talk to you guys, both, all three of you all day long. There's so much information and, and so many more questions that we didn't get to. So we might have to do a second, uh, a second round someday. Um, the, the, uh, what would you say to uh, women that are currently getting their feet wet into medicine in general and what, uh, why should they what will, how would you encourage them to, to look at following the same paths uh, as all three of you being trailblazers and making the, those paths easier, but for them to get involved in fetal medicine, what would you say to them and to encourage them? Well, that's easy for me. Um, I would just say it's the best. It's the most fun. It's the coolest field. Uh, you're never going to get bored. You... It, there's tremendous meaning in the work you do. I don't know why anybody does anything else, frankly. <laughs> That's a great answer. <laughs> I mean, it's completely true, right? I mean, yeah. yeah, you're asking, the problem with asking us is that we, I guess you can't do this unless you really love it. I don't know, but I've never met anybody who is ambivalent about being in this line of work. There are very few people who get started in it and quit and go into something else. And as much as, I hope that there are people about that are passionate about, you know, colon cancer. If I ever get it, um, I just can't imagine doing anything else but what I do. And I'm getting old, um, but I 
just can't imagine stopping it either. <laughs> it's just too exciting. I would say stay true to your passions, you know, and um, don't be discouraged by the history of a field or feeling that it's not achievable or that there isn't a pathway into learning or acquiring skills. You, you really must find and connect with a good mentor and you have to put the work in to get, you know, to receive the benefits as well. But um, I would just encourage women to not be discouraged that there isn't, there isn't a pathway or a way forward or um, a way to get in, involved in this field because there's so much work to do. And, and we certainly can't do, you know, do it alone on the, the group that we have. So almost every specialty of medicine, whether it's surgery, um, OBGYN, pediatrics, pathology, radiology, ethics, there's a pathway to fetal medicine uh, in, in all of those entry points. So genetics, I just, everything has, uh, feeds back to the fetus. I mean, let's just face it, that's where it starts. <laughs> That's awesome. <clears throat> yeah, I, it's super exciting. I am. Um, it's it's the bridge between in utero and you know life after birth and mothers and babies and then babies and neonates and children and and it's it's fascinating and it's a great privilege to bring all these masterminds together and sit in a room and be like, okay, well this is what I know about the uterus and the placenta and being pregnant and to listen to the pediatric surgeons about what they know about the neonate and can everybody kind of enmesh our, our thinking and sciences together and um, try to change the outcome. Um, and so it's, it's really exciting. I've, and I feel very honored and privileged to be a part of this, this masterful group. Um, and, and it, and you, you, this field requires an open mind, it requires um, vision and, and, for, and perseverance and, um, the, the skies, there's no limit of what we, what we can come up with because it's all new and we're all figuring it out together. So it's super exciting. Thank you, Lonnie, for making this happen. No, thank, thank you. And uh, somebody else asked, you know, that's, as former patients, uh, what can we do to help you after going through fetal surgery? We feel need to do something and help bring awareness and but feel lost where to start. And I might start off by answering that is, the you know, Fetal Health Foundation was started by families uh, exactly for this purpose of, of how can we help? It is such a new field. Um, how can we support that? How can we get information out there to other healthcare professionals so they know what options are there for their patients so they can get you to these wonderful three women today who are experts who can provide that hope and all the research and stuff they're doing. And yeah, I would say that um, as, all, as all things, just like fetal medicine has evolved, Fetal Health Foundation has evolved too in what we have been doing and what we look to do the future. And we've really looked at putting out some really bold initiatives um, around some different things that we've done now that we have a, a program where we're doing um, really collaborating and bringing in um, the, the healthcare professionals. Um, and not only just healthcare professionals, but all kinds of multidisciplinary areas that support fetal medicine or can support fetal medicine so that we can learn um, and grow together with the outcome of improving morbidity and mortality rates. You know, it isn't just the thing like, can we do it? And that's cool, but can we do this? And is it going to make a difference? And what are some of the challenges we're facing? So um, when, when uh, you're looking, for those of you watching, when you're looking at ways to help, honestly, one of the best things that you can do is is Fetal Health Foundation is not this big brick mortar building with millions of dollars coming in. We operate very on very low funds. Uh, funds are so important to us, helping fundraise, helping bring in money because a lot of money goes directly into the research that Dr. Stevenson and Dr. Miller and Dr. Farmer are involved with. And I can honestly tell you the research that they do and the amazing work that they do um, is done at a shoestring budget compared to other diseases. Um, I sometimes say that for a million dollars, you can barely turn on the lights for a cancer trial. 
um, but what you guys are doing on $50,000 is completely changes the scope of fetal medicine. That then has implications that can change all areas of medicine. When you're working on the tiniest of patients, um, working inside the womb, imagining some of those things, the tools and instruments and developments that are being done that can be done in pediatric and adult and geriatric medicine is, is pretty incredible when you start looking at it from that uh, basis. So um, I would say, if you want a way to get involved is um, certainly this is a little self-serving because it's also serving back to the patients and the families and the researchers um, and the healthcare professionals, but help support fetal health. Um, which it's very challenging for us to raise funds uh, despite all of our best attempts. So helping us is helping you help others um, make a difference. Um, and that too is, is share your story. The more that you can share your story and get awareness out there, there is very much um, still, and it has changed, but there's still very much a taboo around people talking about pregnancy complications because again, it's the relationship isn't there except for mom and maybe partner and some people in the family kind of get it, but they don't have a relationship with the unborn baby yet, that unborn child. And so there's still a little bit of this taboo of talking about it, of, of how to deal with it. And, you know, we, we, give miscarriage uh, or we give fetal di uh, demise, we give them very clinical sounding names, but to the mom, that was a real loss. To the family, the, the, to the rest of the family, it's how do you deal with that? So um, telling your story, sharing your story um, is another way to do that. Whether it's you know sharing with fetal health, going to your local media and telling them about your story. Um, media is a challenge. We, as I'm sure all of us on, on this uh, webinar today and this chat would say, Media should be covering this every day. This is really cool stuff. Is Dr. Farmer said like this is amazing? Why would you want to do anything else? Like, why would you not want to talk about this 24/7 and see the amazing things that's being done and how cool it is? Like, we can go in these tiny instruments and and or we can look at stem cell research and and uh, fix spina bifida and just the amazing things that are being developed. It's so groundbreaking and so pioneering field. Um, that it, why isn't it being covered in the media all the time? Well, the, the unfortunate thing is media is all about ratings. <laughs> and, uh, you know, these are amazing things going on, but they're not. Um, I, I remember that several years ago, it's probably been a decade ago, but ABC did this thing called Medical Mysteries, and it was filmed out of a, a UK um, uh, stuff. And essentially, they did a... Um, um, made it seem like, you know, twin to twin was a battle between twins trying to survive and take one over the other because of the survival of fittest. And they had to make this very dramatic when it's, it's dramatic enough without that. So that would be with that. And I know we uh, are running over and I know our, our esteemed guests here have other things they need to do. So um, give you a quick opportunity to have any last words that either you'd have, uh, but thank you so, so much for being part of this today. It means a lot to us. And um, we're honored to have you in, uh, with us today and spending the time with us as, uh, and continue to know that as Fetal Health Foundation and as families, we are here to support you and continue to be your biggest cheerleaders. Thank you. Thank you so much, Thank you. Lonnie. Thank you for all you and the foundation does is truly amazing. With that, again, thank you everybody for joining us uh, to Fetal Chat. I'm Lonnie Summers with the Fetal Health Foundation. We'll see you next time.